So I'm self-taught 95% of the time, you know, like I didn't really have a teacher other than my dad would kind of, he wouldn't sit down and be like, all right, play this, play this, play this. He'd, he, but he would do things like, uh, he would do it in this tough love way. Like he'd just sort of poke his head around the door and be like, miss the note and then like <laughs> shut the door again. Thanks. Because he knows me well enough to know that I would have been like, oh, sure. You know, you know, like, go back in <laughs> and just have to get it. it down. Hey everyone, it's Russ and Ryan from AMS here with Rabia Massad. Rabia, we're so happy to have you here. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. So, first question. Okay. Guitar. You getting into guitar, is it true that it kind of stemmed from actually a skateboard accident? Yep, that's what happened. Because you're originally a drummer? Yes. I played okay. drums for eight years old, and then I got into skateboarding as a teen. And it was going really well until it wasn't when I uh, tore my ACL. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> getting over, in over my head with some stairs, so it was bad. And then from there, that's how you just kind of picked it up in recovery mode? Yeah, like I kind of picked it up a couple of times when I was younger, yeah. maybe, I don't know, like 11. But not more than just playing a couple of bar chords or whatever that my dad showed me. But it didn't really interest me, to be honest. So it wasn't that, you know, like when you start playing guitar, there's a bit of a hurdle. Oh, like, yeah. it hurts your like every time I pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the, the, it kind of hurts your fingers and uh, it feels really hard to progress or yeah. at least that's you know what 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 you hear commonly with guitar, uh, whereas drums was it more interactive, it was more fun. It was more right, you could so, bash away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you didn't sound good, it didn't matter because you were having fun hitting stuff. Sure. But like, yeah. So that happened. I would have been around fifteen and like nearly sixteen um, when I got injured, and then I, I remember just being just bored and you know wanting to play guitar because it was in the house. My dad had a couple of guitars. Did you simultaneously keep up with drums though once you were recovered? Uh, not as much, no. I got the bug for guitar. But you do just, play drums as well, right? I do, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to play more than I do. Yeah. But I think, if anything, I'm thankful that I've carried on like writing drums and, and being uh, tuned into what drums should be in the songs and music that I like to write so that at least my understanding of the drums is developed if I can't physically play the parts that I can think right, of. But right. you can hear it in your head. If you've got yeah. a drummer in a session, you're like, no, do it, do it this way. Yeah. And, and I understand it. it enough with regards to like, you know, rudiments and theory and that kind of stuff that I can communicate with drummers to, to kind of give them an idea of what to play. Sure. And when did you start getting into kind of like the band scene once you started picking up the guitar? So like guitar was, I was all about Nuno, Joe Satriani, like a bit of vibe, bit of Yngwie, although I couldn't play. I was like, yeah. Let's put that one down. And what was the start. entry point for all those guys? Like, what was kind of like your... The entry point for me with lead guitar uh -huh. would have been... Actually, it was Master of Puppets. Was it? Even though I, I wasn't into metal or, like, Metallica as a kid, uh, there was a guy working on the house that was into Metallica, and he heard me playing in my room, and he asked me if I like Metallica. I was like, I don't know who they are. He was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and then he was like, all right. And then the next day, he came back with a tab book and the album for Master of Puppets. Yeah. Um... And I remember starting to listen to it and enjoying it, but the tab was really hard to read. I still don't really read tab that well, but it was nice to kind of, oh, you start on this fret and then listen to it and work it out. And it just kind of developed the ear and I got into, I learned Master of Puppets pretty thoroughly. And then it was straight away onto Extreme because my dad liked them. Yep. And I wanted to set my sights really high. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. And so. first guitar and doing all this when you were learning? Uh, the first guitar would have been, well, I was playing my dad's guitars. He had a 79 Strat. Um, not a bad start. Wasn't a bad start. You should no. have seen what I started on, man. <laughs> it's not that. I mean, I did have a very briefly an Epiphone studio okay. for a bit off my friend. But yeah, it was mainly the Strat. And he had a, he had a 94 Jackson Professional. So before EMGs was the thing, it was like these reflex actors. It sounded horrible mm. <laughs> and the neck was really thin but it was cool to have a guitar that was like more aimed at like high gain stuff I but that that begs the question you said you got bitten by the bug at that point mm. you know what what kept you playing even if it was on admittedly you know kind of crappy gear when you get bitten by that bug what compelled you to play what made you want to do it i think it was when you kind of get the uh when you realize that you're playing the parts that you hear on the CD. It's not just noise anymore. Yeah, and yeah. you're like, oh, I'm actually doing it, you know, yeah. like in real time. Like I'm playing along to the solo in Master of Puppets and it actually sounds like the solo in Master of Puppets. That's really cool. Yeah. And then like moving on to things like, actually, I tell a lie, it wasn't just Extreme, it's The Darkness as well. Love that. The that dark, first record, Permission, Permission to Land, Land, still sounds amazing. Yeah, and it was right at the point where 
I started to, because re- I knew nothing. I didn't have any friends that were into it, really. There was a guy around the corner that we used to hang out and play a bit. But I remember not knowing what, like, pentatonic was or, like, the bluesy style that, you know, Justin Hawkins, particularly in his more shreddier stuff on that album, mm-hmm. just thinking that just sounds the coolest thing. Yeah. I know I want to play that and learning that. And that was the bug was going, I can make my way through a song here. But like, can I'm you sing to- like that? No, I, do you know what? When I was at school, <laughs> sounds like it might be, oh, yeah. I tell a lie. Like, uh, <laughs> I was at school and no one wanted to sing. So I sang mm. and we played, I believe in a thing called oh, love mm-hmm. at a, like a school concert. And I had to sing that. Did you nail it? I, I don't know. There's a, probably a video of it somewhere. I haven't <laughs> yeah. watched since that, we I think did we it. need to revisit that. But yeah. Yeah, let's cut to the video now if we can. <laughs> I wish I could find it. My dad's probably got it though. Um, but I, all I remember was the guy, other guy on guitar started the song really fast. Yeah. Like oh, because really you were really nervous. Fast. Yeah. And you started rapping the lyrics at that point. Oh, yeah. 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 you're like, this yeah. is not the right song. Yeah. yeah. And I had to play the lead at the end, you know. Right, right, oh, right. Boy. It was brutal, but yeah, it was good fun. But yeah, I did have to sing that once upon a time. I have to admit that, you know, any, everyone has a warm up riff, you know, anytime yeah. you're getting ready. And Black Shuck, that, that opening what riff. That's a riff. Man, so good. It's is like the yours? best ACDC riff that was never an ACDC song. Yes, I love that song. Yeah. I love that riff. If you nail that, yeah. yeah. You're warmed up. You're ready to go. Yeah, yeah. I like that riff a lot. And when you play it and you know someone's into darkness, and they're like, Black Shook. <laughs> That's right, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of cool. You get that little knowing glance. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> was that your kind of your... Did you have a teacher at that point? Or was the, the music I'm, like your, your yeah, guide? No, I've not had... I'm, so I'm self-taught 95% of uh-huh. the time. You know, like, I didn't really have a teacher. Other than my dad would kind of... He wouldn't sit down and be like, all right, play this, play that, play this. He, he, but he would do things like... Uh, remember to use your pinky, you know, like remember to use your little finger. I didn't, so don't make the same mistake. And he would like give you lots of advice along the way. And if I was like sat in my room trying to nail a solo, rather than coming in and he would do it in this tough love way. Like he'd just sort of put his head around the door and be like, missed a note and then like <laughs> shut the door again. Thanks. Because he knows me well enough to know that I would have been like, I'll show you. And then you know, like, go back in <laughs> and just have to it. get it down. And at least you knew he was listening. I yeah, mean, There's yeah. that kind of connection there. You know, yeah, it was, was nice. this kind of like, it was support, but in a really like unique way that, you know, at the time I knew that I, he was supportive, but he wouldn't like sort of mollycoddle me with it. Like, mm-hmm. which I think is good, you know, so you find your own way with it. I remember learning uh, Hotel California solo, but, I didn't know what bending was. Mm-hmm. So I played, I learned the solo, I like transcribed it, and I was Playing like, jazz was version. Opening <laughs> intro. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it. he was like, it's really good, son, but um, I think I need to teach you what bending is. <laughs> you know, you have to sit there and like, yeah, change, change my world. And I can't, yeah, it would have sound, I, I imagine it sounded really bad. So what about band wise? We were talking about that, like first band. So you're, you're starting to pick this stuff up. You're, yeah. you're teaching yourself, you're learning. Now you're in, you talked about that particular band. Was that your first? Yeah, so there was like little fun stuff at school, but it, obviously you're at school and people just doing it because it's fun and they all kind of went off and did other stuff after school. Uh, so like serious band wouldn't have been until I was like maybe 16, 17. So I'd been playing like a year and I'd progressed quite pretty quickly. pretty quick, yeah. yeah. I was gonna say. So I was, all I was focused on at that time was like, because I couldn't skate anymore and school was kind of wrapping up around that time. Uh, I just spent most of my evenings in my room playing. So, and I picked it up qu- pretty quick. I guess had it having like timing from drums and I guess I just had a half decent ear to work out what I wanted to, you know, if I heard the way someone phrased a lick, then I would really get zoned in on making it sound the same to me. So if, if, it, if it had the same sound and the same feel with it, whether it was the vibrato or something Bending. about it yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly right. that i would be like okay that sounds right you know yeah. I, i'd be very critical of if it didn't so i think i just learned quite fast but all i cared about was shredding like at that time it was just like extreme satriani like and my uh my friend asked he they'd lost their guitarist he'd moved to uh, australia so i joined that band and immediately started to try and put solos in all the songs <laughs> and they were like, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's cool. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, and I succeeded in a few of the songs putting solos in. But um, it wasn't until uh, maybe six months into that band, they showed me Incubus. Okay. Like, Because I was like, just focused on, I like Extreme. I like Sat. Sat like, and that's cool. it. Like, yeah, and I wasn't really, yeah. yeah. I mean, prior to learning guitar, I was into bands like 
I was really into new metal as a younger, like before I turned sort of 13, 14. Like, corn and biscuit. Yeah, corn and biscuit, Deftones, like that we kind of stuff. We can edit that out. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I also loved Soundgarden, um, okay, that's better. a bit of grunge and stuff like yeah. that. Um, Silverchair, but I don't know how that sits with people over here. Uh, they still play a few of their yeah. songs here. Yeah, it's yeah. been a weird trajectory for that band, but uh, yeah. they had some great stuff. And the key there, too, they had great melody. That's it. I really, really enjoyed that's the when songwriting. You get in. There yeah. were some really good moments on those on those albums. But uh, so I was kind of I obviously liked bands and stuff, but I was just so tunnel vision on being a lead player. And then it was Incubus that I somehow missed when I was into the new metal stuff. It would have been Morning View and Make Yourself as like a double whammy. Like here yep. you go, have these two albums. And I was just immediately just hooked on Incubus, and I just loved the approach to writing songs. You know, because it was riffy. It had really good groove. Because it, re I didn't realize they came up in the new metal era when I discovered them. I just assumed they were just yeah. A they kind of, uh, I will say, outgrew that. But I mean, in terms of melody, kind of took over, and his mm. use of effects was really cool. Yeah, like, you know, which I thought you know, it's easy to plug in a heavy guitar into a dual rectifier mm. and chug away. I will do that all day if you mm. let me. But when you hear how to use the effects in the context of a song, mm -hmm. then you go, okay, yeah. shredding's great, but I want to do that. Yeah, exactly. You know? And like the warmth was such an amazing song. Like with all the dual phaser in the middle of the song yeah. and that, the way it kind of oscillates with it, stuff like that. I just remember thinking that's just the coolest thing. And then they showed me, they, they did a, a Live at Red Rocks mm -hmm. DVD. We used to watch that like all the time and just, I just got hooked on the band. And then, um, so that was my like entry point into, oh, I want to be in a serious band now. I'm not bothered about shredding anymore. I yep. just want to focus on riffs and songwriting. chord progressions and songwriting and stuff. And, and I'm glad because although obviously I love playing technical guitar, to, yep. you know, it's fun. But sort of since then, the, one of the bigger priorities for me has been writing music as opposed to just playing lead. So if, if Nuno and Joe and um, there's a third one there. Nuno, Joe, you said third influence. Paul earlier. Simon. <laughs> if they Did were like your like early influence. My dad was a fan. Yeah. Yeah. You've ever listened to his playing? Oh, well, Simon's amazing. Great. Yeah. I was just throwing it out there to be cheeky, but uh, but who would be your like your at this phase mm -hmm. the guys that you were kind of like looking to? Well, the heroes of, of like bands and stuff. Yeah, because the, the entry point, like you said, was Nuno. It was Joe mm -hmm. every day, any day, mm -hmm. and now you're kind of entering into Incubus and Silverchair and all these stuff. Yeah, who are those go-to guys now? Who you're nowadays, um, or at least yeah. I mean, then then Carnival. I heard Carnival in 2009. Do you know Carnival? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was like life changing. So I heard that and I was like, they're playing the kind of music that I dream of being able to write, you know, like where you've got the idea of the kind of thing you want to try and do. And I was like writing a lot with the band. And I would, I would say that it was in that vein, but I had never, I'd never heard of them. And then when I heard them, it was like, oh, this is what I'm trying to do. You know, it was like yeah. really like a moment of this is the thing that I want to be able to do like that. Um, and I think after that, yeah, I was just, they are like, 100% favorite band. Wow. Like, wow. Like, okay. I have a lot of bands that I really enjoy, but Carnival, there isn't a, like, particularly Sound Awake, uh, NA Symmetry, those two albums, like, there isn't a bad song. Like, I just. So, how do you satisfy both sides of that? You love a good song, mm -hmm. but you still want to, you still want to rip a little bit here yeah. and there. And, and you worked hard to get to that point. I think for a while here, there was, it kind of got denigrated. If you were a shredder, it was kind of mm. meant like, oh, okay, you know, you, you don't know how to play with taste and feel. Yeah. And we know that there's a difference. I mean, mm -hmm. you can do both. And I think, I think that's one thing that a lot of people missed growing up as a Van Halen fan. There were a lot of guys that could, they could play those parts, but, and Ed even said it, he's like, everyone can pick up on the, the, the style and the, um, the speed, mm -hmm. but they can't cop the feel. Mm -hmm. And that to me is the most important thing that any guitar player would have, where eventually you go, this is, this is how I play. This is the yeah. feel that I can inject into it. And I could say, well, I, I could hear you playing that. And I go, I know who it is right away. Do you feel like you've arrived at that point when someone says, man, that, that's totally in your style? Or do you feel like you're still developing? Uh, that's a great question. And I feel like, I always feel like we're still developing. Like I think everyone's still learning and developing. I don't think that necessarily stops. I think um, there was a point where, like, I got really into like strats and like vintage style playing yeah. the bluesier stuff. Like, That's great. And, and and then geeking out with that. And I think that inherently has a lot of feel. You know, it's part of the thing to really feel every sure. note that you play. Sure. And I think then melding that together with more of the technical stuff and the modern stuff that. And then guys like, I remember when Matthias Asata came on the scene, that was a really good example of, I guess, sitting and playing on your own, 
bits of melody, bits of technique and creating music by yourself that was a, a little light bulb moment. Like, oh, I guess you can. You don't need to sit and shred or like, you know, like that thing where you go to a guitar shop and you sit down and you're like, what am I going to play? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that <laughs> stairway? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, there way, of course. <laughs> Oh, I, uh, sweet I child usually mine do as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a big one. Haganini <laughs> for me, you know. Oh, yeah. Like to, yeah, do that. Yeah. Nice. No, that's a lie. That's a, that's a lie. <laughs> but I would say that, like, he kind of, uh, the way that he kind of came on the scene and played like that kind of made me feel like I can sit on my own and play mm -hmm. um, and create this, like, a little mood, whether it's Textures. just a few chords or, like, you know, some little bit of melody and stuff. And it kind of gets rid of that feeling of, oh, I've got to be one or the other do you know what i mean like yeah, andy timmons does together. that for me you know when yeah. i hear you know i hear something like that and and touch and feel and the guy can blaze yeah no problem yeah. but he's not necessarily interested in doing that yeah playing some kind of curtis mayfield type stuff just melodic mm -hmm. semi overdriven i mean that's the kind of stuff that every time you feel like you're in a rut there's always someone else you can listen to and go oh yeah i forgot yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what it's about and I, I'm, I'm definitely like i think uh, you mentioned uh, earlier about the idea with um the technical guitar playing, especially modern, like if you're into writing and stuff, how do you incorporate that in and stuff? Like I feel like progressive metal is a prime example of trying to do that because a lot of bands now with the gent bands and stuff, like as as cool as they are and as technical as it is, and it's hard to play like that. Like don't get me wrong, it's ridiculously hard to play some of those riffs. But for me, uh, a lot of it is just too many riffs. There's too many too much movement in it. Like mm -hmm. I really, I think brought up on more songs because mm -hmm. you know, you have sections that repeat if they're a really nice section. If you write a really good riff, you should sure. repeat it, you know, rather yeah. than move on to the next one. Absolutely. But I think there's a certain sense that, especially a lot of artists in, that, in certain genres, they feel obligated. Yeah, there you know, is someone's that. buying, I got to put 15 riffs to the song and it's like, not necessarily, you know? Yeah. I mean, a good riff, like you said, I mean, listen to Back in Black. I don't know a better riff than right. that. And they didn't feel <laughs> obligated to, I'm sorry. I yeah. mean, you know, it's... There's a, it's a great example of what I mean though. You know, right. like if it's, if it's great, don't to let, let it have its moment kind of thing. Um, and so even though I did get a bit, a little bit by the bug of like progressive music, I remember in Tosca, my older band, that we actively tried to, not do too much of that like there are lots of sections in the songs because they're like 10 minutes long or whatever right <laughs> but we would let certain sections simmer for a while and like repeat them and stuff to really create a mood and just add more text dynamics as opposed to like here's another riff here's another riff here's another riff so um yeah i think somewhere i fall somewhere in the middle of that which i still like to play technically and 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 do that kind of stuff more progressive than i guess the really technical stuff but for me, it's so important to write a good tune that makes you feel something. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to do. It is really hard to do. Yeah. But if it makes me feel something when I write a chord progression or something, if, if it pulls on the heartstrings a bit or like something, it gives you a mood or a feeling. How do you remember that? Like if you're on a plane or you're in the car like, and you know something's good, you're like, I'm going to... Because oh, I always tell myself, I'll remember out. it later. Yeah, nah, nah, nah. Do you do it into the phone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you can play to. part. <laughs> yeah. To be fair, like... It would be as great as heads. That would be hilarious to release voicemails. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't feel like I have a lot of... There's not been a lot of moments in the last few years where that's happened. They're usually in the studio or something. You can yeah, get it down. I mean, I'll get my phone out if I'm sat with the guitar. If right. I've come across something that I like, yeah. I'll quickly chuck it on and press record and then play it in. Sure. And it might be like the worst take of it ever, but at least it's given me... You got me, the feel. Yeah. Right, yeah, that was it. So, um, and that's been great. But also, like, just being in the room, like, with this new band that I've got, like, just being in the room with another musician to bounce off, like, I really like bouncing off one other person. Like, sometimes in a band, you're all in the room together and you can, like, it can sometimes get a little bit convoluted. The, Too the many cooks the, in the kitchen? Yeah, and, and, and sometimes it can be um, a bit hard to stay on track with the original idea before because i i like to hear something kind of reasonably developed to know if it's going to work before moving on yeah um but when there's just one of you when it's, when there's just one other person with you it's quite easy to know if it's going to work straight away sure. like they're feeling it too you know? so that takes us to like even the totemist and before we kind of jump into that new ep mm -hmm. um the recording side of you is, yeah. is just another element so at what age did that even kind of start and get going where you're like let me uh turn on i don't know tape recorder let me turn on a computer let me get it going with a basic daw ah that, that great question again it's something that in the last few years i've definitely become hooked on but like in in my old band tosca that 
so the, the the bass player Dave and the drummer Ben and myself met when we were like 17. Yep. So we've always played together in whatever band it was, whether it was a Dojo with Rob Chapman or Tosca or whatever. Like we even played in a, a band with this guy called James Toslin that was like a super bike world champion, had this classic rock album that he asked huh. us to come and play with. So we've all, we've done all sorts of different stuff. But Dave was always the guy uh -huh. that would record. Okay. Um, he was always the one into, he would have logic on his MacBook and like we'd always, he'd record the demos or whatever and throw up a mic or whatever. So you were leaning on him. Yeah. And I, I'd just sort of sit and watch a lot of the time. I, I knew I had my opinions on how I wanted it to sound. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd give suggestions, but I'd, I, maybe not that he, he, he wouldn't let me. It wasn't like he's holding the wheel, <laughs> but it was more just like, well, he's doing it. I'm just going to sit and right, right. just kind of watch and whatever. Uh, and it wasn't until really, I suppose, getting more involved into the YouTube side of things where I had to start recording my own guitar tones uh, and things like, you know, originally Superior Drummer became really popular and stuff like that where I could sort of make tracks at home. Program them. Yeah, and program it. And then, and then rather than it just being this like horrible sounding demo, like I started to get more into how do I make it sound more like the thing that I want it to sound like, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you yeah. hear all these other bands releasing records. It's like, well, if I've got an idea, I kind of, it's not just the, it's not just like the chords or the riffs or the parts that are inspiring. It's also the way it sounds. Like I sometimes feel like if a, if a record's badly mixed, you might say you don't like it, not because you don't like the parts, but subconsciously it sounds terrible to you. Sure. And you go, ah, oh, it's not my thing because it's not mixed well. Yep. So like it's all that that I started thinking about and like I'd really like to understand this more and more and just started doing it more and more on my own with logic and stuff. So that would have been like 20, 2015, I would okay. say, is when I started really looking into it more and starting to record myself and like uh, Did you find a struggle myself. with that though? Like it they kind of almost well, like, everything was slammed. Because I think like yeah. a lot of a lot of folks, like once they get into the home studio game, mm-hmm. Then you're playing both sides, right? So you're you're the musician, yeah. you're all, and then you can kind of almost go down rabbit holes on both sides, you and you have to try to pull yourself back. So did that kind of become like a... I feel like I was slightly lucky being into YouTube and demoing because one of the responsibilities there was that the product has to sound right. You have Full to, package, it has to sound good. Yeah, yeah you have the to plan represent... The playing could be great, but... Yeah. If I record it badly, the guys are going to come like, what have you done? Like, it's not how it sounds. And then people on Lionel comment and, you know. So I, I felt like I had to learn. I, I like learned to mic up cabs and do that first, which I think was really important. But then when you start recording at home, you have to use load boxes. And, and was that more and trial and error? Or what, how do you feel that you learned it best? What, with micing up cabs? Yeah, I mean, there's an art to that. Yeah. Uh, again, trial and error. Like, yeah. You know, using a bit of, I mean, Dave, again, would be really helpful in the in the early stages, but also using a bit of, I guess, common sense, like the closer to it. You can hear that in the middle, it's really bright and on the edges. Got so it. I did a lot of that. Um, and also working with Andertons, you know, doing the, uh, the great, audio yeah. for them back in the sure. day. Um, and then I think because every video was a different piece of gear, it would be a clean amp, it would be a, a vintage amp, it would be you a pedal. Spectrum it would be, to yeah. just like... So just having to work it out, Yep. on on the fly thing was really helpful and so yeah and so i think then doing my own youtube stuff it was also really helpful to just have to get good at making the guitar sound yeah. how it sounded in the room like and communicating that through to was YouTube. that 15 when you started your channel roughly around the same time or was that I a little doing after I, I started my channel in 2011 but i didn't start really wow doing it yeah, properly yeah yeah it was yeah. just like a casual thing that sure it's like the odd thing here and there but i didn't start doing it like properly, like, oh, I'm going to do this until, sure. yeah, 2014, 2015. Got so, bitten by a different bug. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was when I realized I had an opportunity maybe to to do that professionally and so that I could stop working in bars and, you know, offices and stuff because I used to work in, like, debt collection mm -hmm. and stuff when I was younger. You didn't like that? No, it was absolutely miserable. <laughs> it was so, felt so bad. I'm not, I'm not the guy to deliver bad news to people. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, but you bring up a good point, and I think... Also, to the point of the fact that you've been doing this since 2011, a lot of people have come and gone since then. The mm. road is kind of littered with people who go, I'm going to get on YouTube and I'm going to be streaming into a million computers a day. And, mm. and what it comes down to is there are good players, there are good musicians, and then someone has that bit of a third rail going on where you, had, you tapped into the idea of how is it going to sound good? How am I going to present this? It's not just about getting up and playing a million notes. It was like, I want to have the perfect presentation of what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, that's when it really catches fire. And so the time that you took to get the production skills in, 
a lot of people couldn't be bothered by that. They're like, well, I just want to play. I mm-hmm. want to get gear, and I want to and to take the time and really open up and see what it does. That's probably the key to why you're still doing it. I would think. I mean, maybe it's like it's the representation of what it is you're trying to do. Like you say, like the mixing and the music came into it. Like always, music was at the forefront. Of course. So I was always still playing in bands and touring and doing all that kind of stuff outside of YouTube. But then when I started maybe writing stuff for myself, uh, when I started going, oh, maybe I'll make a track for this video for this demo because it would be better shown in context. So I'd make a track and then it's like, well, now it's like my original ideas. It's the music. It has to be represented sure. kind of right. So there was, a, there was a, a, an emphasis on that. So yeah, like, I've, yeah, I've always just wanted to keep progressing and it's been, it's up and down, you know, like doing the content stuff, especially when you're doing it yourself, like, mm. uh, and then you start thinking, oh, maybe I don't want to just do demos and maybe I've gone too far. Now everyone sees me as like a demo guy, which mm-hmm. is fine. Dead balance. But, you know, knowing me myself, like it's all about playing on stage, going on tour, writing music, you know, that's priority number one. So that that's home for you. Not the studio. The studio is more of like, a, like forget, forgetting the YouTube side, mm-hmm. just like the recording side. Are you more of the studio guy? Or are you more of the live guy? I don't know. And nowadays it's hard to say. And just because there's such an enjoyable factor of building a record, like right. mm-hmm. hearing it, hearing it turn into a body of work that you can be truly like proud of and put it on and listen to it and think, wow, that's really cool. Like we create. Ah, so so there's- you do listen to your own stuff. But most <laughs> oh, guys yeah. say they don't. No, I, 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 if you want to call it arrogant or like it gets, no, 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 I, I think you have to be, I think you have to be a fan of your own music. I think you do. Cause it it's be the what same you with anything. I like to cook. Yeah. And I like the idea of eating something that I made. I, yeah. It would be stupid to just make it and give it to someone else. It's like, you should be proud of that. Yeah, or a painting. That's kind of the point. You're not going to do a painting and then go, oh, it's terrible. And, you know, like, right. You're painting what you want to see. And it's the same with, for me with music. It's like, don't get me wrong. Like, I don't think that the music I create is as good as the, the bands that I love. Mm. Like, because it doesn't work like that. Like, but you're proud of it. 100%. As you should be. I, and, and I, yeah, I'll listen to it. Not necessarily to sit there and go, this sounds great. I love it. <laughs> yeah. But to, to listen to it and think to myself like, yeah, no, I, I'm into that vibe. I'm convinced by it as a listener. I try and put myself more of like a, a listening perspective. And also, where could it be better? Where could it improve? What would I have done differently this time around? And I think that's another thing that kind of comes through in a lot of the videos that you do is, is that it's genuine. I don't feel like you're pandering to anybody. Even if you're doing a demo or something, it seems to me like when I watch your videos, and I've watched many of them, I just feel like I'm watching someone enjoying the concept of making music, whether yeah. it's trying out a different guitar or different. You, when I watch you play, uh, you could see that you're enjoying it. Some people, it, you can't tell, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you can't hide it. And yeah. that's, that is a big part of why people are into music at any given point. When you see a good band or a good artist, you want to see them enjoying themselves, which, whatever way they do that. And I think that comes through in a lot of what you do, which is harder to do than... I appreciate that, yeah. man. And I think... And, I, and one thing I tried to always make clear as well is like when I'm reviewing or like demo, whatever you want to call it, on my channel, it's like a brand might go, oh, we want you to check out this 10 watt practice amp. I'd be like, no, because even if they were going to pay me to do that, it's mm-hmm. like, but I'm not going to enjoy it. It's not really the kind of thing. Yeah, I would always, I would, and I've made it clear on my channel as well that I always used to just check out gear that I thought that'd be cool. Like, sure. let's see how it sounds. And then there are, the, like you say, there are videos where, I, rem- I can remember some of them where I'm just like in it because it's making me come up with a cool riff or like, yeah. I'll just start riffing for like 20 minutes. Sure. And John has to edit it down to like a tiny thing. But you know, you'd also be doing them a disservice if the, here's a 10 watt practice amp, you say, well, I, I wouldn't really be getting into it at that point. Yeah. It, it, it's not just about that you wouldn't be enjoying it. It's not in your wheelhouse or, or it's not something that interests you genuinely. I think there are plenty of people on YouTube that will take anything that's put in their hands and yeah. tell you how much they love it. Um, and as, especially as you get to the echelon that you've gotten to, you know, the more people that watch, the more realistic and the more genuine you have to be. Yeah. It's like when brands want you to release all on the same day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, yeah. Kind That's of a thing. tough one. I've stopped, I just, well, and I've, I've kind of not, I, want, I don't want to say officially, but I've definitely just said, like, I'm not really demoing anymore. Like, it's not really what I want to do because of the state it's got into now with stuff like that. Like, I'll still work with brands that have been close friends over the years. Mm-hmm. You know, like, obviously with Victory and stuff, it's different because, you know, I helped design the stuff, but also, like, you know, like Origin and Boss and like, there's a, there's a bunch of great brands like Strymon I've used for so many years. I'm always happy to check out that stuff, but it's not from a demoing perspective. Here's my opinion. You should buy it. Like, no, it's just, 
I'm just going to play through it and see how I feel. And if you like the sound of it, then maybe you'll go check it out for yourself. But as a demo guy, like I don't really have any interest in that so much anymore. So yeah, just trying to change it up now, be sure. more musical. Just it should be more about guitar and the journey of guitar and being a guitarist and yep. being in a band and just all that other stuff. Uh, without having to say, here's what the gain sounds like at 12 o'clock, you know? <laughs> so let me ask you this. You ever flip on the lights and look at all the gear and go, I am so sick of this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, when I moved into my new studio, I did set it all up and I was like, oh my God. I gotta get away. So much gear in here. <laughs> so much. Because again, like, and I was saying this uh, to Anthony as well the other day, we were chatting and I was like, you know what's really funny? It's like when, you, when you're starting out and you're trying to do this, you wish that you had the opportunity to have this gear. All this gear. And then you start doing it and then like you get it all sent over and you start having to pay for less things with the gear and stuff. And it, I just find that so weird. You're like, now I'm in a position where I could, if I need to go and buy an amp, I'll, I'll buy an amp. Mm. You know, don't get me wrong. I'm not like the rich or any, in any case, but I've obviously done well over the years that I could pick up a piece of gear if I needed it. But m nine times out of 10, it just gets sent your way, you know, because of what you do for a living. And I just find it so odd. It like, does take some of the luster away from it. It does. Yeah. yeah. You suddenly, I remember like ordering my uh, Nuno Washburn. Sure. And I remember, couldn't M4. sleep. Yeah. yeah. M4, yeah. It's going to be here. Yeah. I could yeah. not sleep. Yeah. And when it turned up, I like left work early. I told him that I had a doctor's appointment or something. I, I definitely got <laughs> off work a few hours early. <laughs> Nerd. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I was just like ecstatic. And, you know, like what, you know, like with certain things, you kind of have a similar feeling, but it's never quite the same as it was back then when oh, you yeah. really, really worked and like had to like save and get like, I don't know. I just find that an interesting perspective, but yeah, to answer your question, like I sometimes stand in that room, like I f it almost feels uh, Dirty. wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like with all this stuff, cause I never sell the gear that gets sent. Cause I think. Not only is that really cheeky in my mind, but I also think, well, what if they're like, hey, you know that pedal we sent you? Yeah, like, we need that back. Yeah, we need <laughs> yeah. that back. And I'm like, I don't have it anymore. It's on reverb. Yeah, that, that, I'd be, that's just so wrong. So yeah. I've, I've always, I've just hang, hung on to it all. So where do you keep it all? I have a studio in Brighton so, yeah. now. Yeah, yeah it's a where warehouse. I, yeah. I put all, it used to be in my house. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I decided to start renting a place where I could have a drum kit set up and yeah. like it's a proper live room control room situation. So I can actually like, write and record like the Totemist stuff. I was going to say, is that the... um, But I have it all set up in there because I'll film videos in there too. So there's like a wall of cabs. So with you can just come in and boom, turn it on and you're pretty much ready to go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you can just pick and choose the things that you want That's for recording, great. which is a dream come true, like genuinely amazing. But at the same time, there are moments where you're like, yeah, it feels a bit dirty. So when... what do you do when that happens to kind of cleanse your palate? Do you just go play drums? Do you go for a walk? I mean, how do you get that? I always find that... It, I'm as good at playing guitar or anything if I play it 10 days in a row or I walk away from it for two days. Somehow I come back to it with a renewed appreciation for it or something. I don't know if that happens with you, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm fun with guitar and I'm sure like everybody goes through this, but like not to touch on it massively, but with, especially with social media as well, when, you, when you're scrolling and you see sure. all these phenomenal players and stuff. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes I'm just like, what am I even doing? Yeah. So I just like. Burn it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's how I feel. So like. <laughs> And, I, and I'll f kind of not fall out of love with guitar because I always like writing music. But as like a lead player I was talking about earlier, mm. I sometimes think, well, oh, I'm not as interested now because clearly I haven't worked hard as these guys. So I'm just going to focus on, uh, it might be sl slightly self-deprecating, but you know what I mean? Like yeah. I'll just focus on writing instead now and just wow. like crack on with bands and stuff. And then I get the bug back where I'm like, oh, I haven't practiced and I really want to be able to play that lick or something. And then I go get back in. It. Yeah, and it's just this constant up yeah. and down. Um, but I've never really had that feeling of like not wanting to do it at all or like... Never got the burnout. No, not really. No, luckily at this point. Um, and I'm not suggesting that you do. No. Just, but, you know, <laughs> given the fact that you did this as something you enjoyed doing, you were compelled to do it, you loved to do it. And then as your job is to be around all that stuff and to yeah. do it. And eventually you could get to the point where you've, you do risk the feeling of burnout. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I always tell people music is the most fun you can have without getting into trouble. I mean, it, there's nothing bad that can come from it. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I would say I've had that feeling with demoing, yeah, with making really? review videos. I just they don't interest me anymore. Like, really? Unless okay. it's something that 
like I'm proud of or like I or know it's gonna, socks off, yeah. yeah, or that it's going to uh, influence something cool within the creative process. Sure. So like I could say that about like Strymon, for example, like I've, I've had those same pedals on my board for since they came out, you know, and then when they bring out something new, I'm like, well, nine times out of 10, it's going to be sick. Like, or at least that's my expectation of them. And usually it is. So I, I, and I'll try it out and think, well, I could use this in a song and, and, or something like that. And same with like victory, you know, like the amps are great. So I, I'll happily check them out and all that kind of stuff. But I've definitely, uh, burnt out a little bit with that side of it especially since you know there are certain like personalities online that i suppose we were talking about earlier <laughs> that i guess um create a, this layer of cynicism across the board now sure. which it's fine to be cynical about when you're watching if you're going to spend your money on something you want to trust the person that you're watching and you don't want to feel sure. like you're being played or it's not a shill no, but there's almost now this like opinion that everybody's like that. Which like, now goes the opposite end of the spectrum. Yeah, not everybody's like that. Yeah, it swung the other way really far. Sure. And, and I, I just think that's a shame. But also... Dan and Mick is a great example of guys who they yeah. give their honest opinion as well. Oh, and you yeah. could, again, you, know, you, you could see they're the really enjoying it. They're yeah. enjoying it. They're not similar mindset. Even working, in, in yeah. working for a company that sells musical gear. I mean, if you had told me at 15 that I'd be doing this at 50, I'd say you're crazy there's a reason why we all enjoy doing this because yeah. we all love to play it we all love to try this stuff out it makes you feel good yeah and there's nothing wrong with that but also knowing when it's like i need a break you know sometimes yeah. you can just kind of you know and well, it could be one day and you come back yeah. completely revitalized yeah and i i, I, I yeah like in, similar to what you just said like i had no no idea that i'd be doing this as like a career like and get, got to have done some of the stuff that I have or travel places that I have, like being here, for example. Mm -hmm. like, you know, I didn't go to America. Well, the this first is the ultimate, did. I would imagine, for <laughs> yeah. you. Because you can probably hang it up after this. <laughs> no, it's great, though, to be able to come out here and hang out and just yeah. meet new people and, like, talk about this stuff. Like, I mean, I didn't go to the States until I was, like, 19 or something because mm -hmm. there was no opportunity in what I was doing when I was... Well, actually, no, I was older than that. I would have been, like, 22, maybe. I can't remember. But the point being that it was, it was this kind of career path that mm. allowed me to come and travel to cool places. Sure. So like, you know, sometimes my girlfriend will be like, do you ever stop working? Like, do you ever stop? Like, is it I'm work like, though? It doesn't feel like the work. Yeah. That's what I say. I'm yeah, like, right. yeah, but it's not work. Like literally it's music and guitar. Like, how could I not just want to do this all the time? And you could always go back to the office. Debt job, collections you know? is just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, knowing yeah, that you, know you have I mean. something to fall back on is a good thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let, let's talk about Totemist. <laughs> okay. Oh, Am I saying yeah. it right too, by the way? <laughs> Totemist? The Totemist, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the CP. Was it recorded in your new studio? Yeah. I mean, we, so it was recorded at Brighton Electric Studios and then my studio for two of the songs. For two of the songs. Yeah. So there's four songs, two of them recorded in the studio and then. And going back to what you alluded to earlier. So it was you and drummer. Yeah. The two, two of you going at it from songwriting from top to bottom. Did you kind of come in with ideas? Did he have it? Was like, where did that collaboration? So he was in a band. So he's called Liam Keeley and he's in, a, he was in a band called Black Peaks, mm -hmm. which I don't think they ever played out here, but they were amazing. And, and the, we played together. Tosca, my old band, and then played a few times, and it was a similar kind of thing. But they broke up around the same time as Tosca did, at the start of lockdown. It would have been mm -hmm. around that period. Um, but we were we'd been friends since I guess 2015 because we both skate. We love skating. Mm -hmm. So like, he's amazing. At Carefully skating. skating. Yeah. yeah, full circle right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I got back into it and started right. doing it a little bit more. Uh, but he, he, but he's also really into it. So we became friends that way. And we'd always kind of been mates and seen our bands doing this, that, and the other, but then they both broke up. Um, and we were at the skate park one day and we were like, why have we, we should totally just like hire that. So Brighton Electric Studios is down the road from where I live. And Hannah, my girlfriend, she works there. And um, the owner is a really good, well, not the owner, like the head honcho there is a really good friend of mine. He's also in a band called Tiger Cub that are playing out in the States right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And they're really good. In any case, he was like, well, you know, no one's there. Like, why don't you just... Hint, hint. Go down yeah. there, you know. <laughs> so... And this it, was during COVID? But it was, it was in that... So in England, when they eased it off and, you know, like you have your bubble kind of thing, that you right. can have like a small number of people that you can be around. Okay. So it wasn't during the like height of it where everyone well, was... I'm not implicating in you in it. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, he was like, there's no one there. Like, <laughs> you should just go and set up and like... And you probably were pent up at that point too. I would yeah, think you had a we lot were, to come we, out. And... Yeah, because of the bands breaking up. And sure. So me and Liam were like, 
why have we never done this? You know, Jimmy said we can go and use one of the rooms, so let's 100% just go and see yeah. what happens. Why not? So, yeah, we set up mics, um, drums, obviously, guitar. And it was like we had three days. Yeah, it was like 72 hours. Okay. So we just went for it. And it was just a case of just like, oh, here's a riff. What do you think? Yeah, that's cool. Here's some drums. Like, And we just bounced off each other. As I was saying earlier, working with just one other person. Sure. Mm -hmm. They just bouncing back and forth. And we just just churned out those three songs in so we wrote them wrote three songs in the two days and on the third day we recorded all the drums and the like bass not bass guitar but the so how are you tracking that guitar. though well we had the stu so it was a studio so we had the live room and a control room so i'd like run in record run back uh, but yeah. the two of you guitar and drums are tracking together yeah in the same room yeah 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 um which is cool because like if you solo like the overheads you can hear the guitar Bleed, and, bleeding through you yeah yeah but it was put, they were put behind like gogos like that kind yep, of thing. Yep, so yep, they yep. Were, it was fairly well treated. Um, but yeah, so we, we, we'd sort of written these three tunes and then on the third day we had to, well, Liam really <laughs> had to track them like f for the proper take, you know? Yeah. So it was really intense. Click or but no that click. rush kind of makes uh, it. We did have click, yeah. Did yeah. Have click. But it, it, it's, that sense of urgency kind of informs how, the, how it came out. I mean, if you have all the time in the world, which is a luxury as we know. Yeah. Sometimes it's nice to have that feeling of like, man, we got to get this yeah, done. Yeah, we got to we got to get cracking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, sorry, I had to do it. I'm a dad. That no, was good. I Thank it. you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, but is that as minimalist as you get? I mean, do you ever envision yourself being like a Lenny Kravitz or Dave Grohl and just going in and doing it all yourself, or do you like having that one person to kind of bounce things off of? I mean, I've done that with my own like the demos, like grinding like gears the three, and things, the three like, volumes. When I did the my archetype plugin, I had to write like I like doing that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. but. Um, I would say it's a it takes a little bit longer because you feel like there's a sense of urgency when there's someone else there to yeah. keep 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 the momentum going. But yeah, with that particular EP, it was very much just that electrifying kind of like this is just happening. Yeah, we're striking it. Here. And then at the yeah. end of the EP, like the last track, you can I left it in because it's really funny because we finished the last song, and you can hear Liam just like go crazy at the end like yes because we'd actually <laughs> nailed it. it yeah he'd actually got it right we played through it he made it to the end of the song and uh it's just really funny so i left that in <laughs> yeah, so but it's also a testament to how exciting it still is after all yeah. this uh, you know it's like we still got it you know it's like we got down what we wanted to get down it's the same 12 notes as everyone else yeah. is using how did we do it where it was like that's exactly how i heard it in my head that's got to be really satisfying yeah and and for me as well like the satisfying part was the direction of the songs was slightly different to what i'd done before like for a start i was using a strat i was using single coils on this mm -hmm. on that ip which was a, a nicer you know like when you pick up a certain guitar it makes you play of course differently, differently. and it the same applies for writing as well like up until that point i was always using like modern humbucker style guitars that yeah. made me play riffs in a certain way whereas with this it was like just a nice different approach and so that informed the, the sound of the record um and then listening back to it when i took the sessions home to start like adding all the bass and the other layers and stuff listening to it going i don't think i would ever have written this like section or riff like this if it was in any other context than the, what it was like it just came out sure so it was really uh novel the experience what gear did you end up bringing into this the studio for those three particular days pedal like so it was the, under the sun, but it was the two the and... dual kraken stereo rig uh -huh. uh, and my pedal board that has you know the trifecta okay and like yeah, yeah. good term it's a nice one that, yeah. <laughs> like that. it was almost <laughs> as good as get cracking <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we can edit that out uh, but it had yeah it had those it had like all my fuzzes i have like four or five different fuzzes on the board octave pedal obviously there's no bass player there yep so i'd use the octave pedal quite heavily on that the pog um a lot of fun and yeah. are you making like how how'd you end up making up the cabs and just the a couple of 57s okay because i knew that i'd go home and like record m way more than what we could at the time so the the guitar tracks were recorded at the time yeah nice. sorry i feel but you know, yeah <laughs> yeah i think i bought a t-shirt in the last subtle. 20 years <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's good but uh yeah the guitar tracks that i recorded are still used on that EP, uh -huh. but they were kind of like the scratch tracks. But there were certain moments and things that that made it onto still the final the, thing. Yeah, yep. Isn't for it great though? You could whatever. you could just take that from you were noodling in your house and you could fly it over to the studio and yeah, still use that because that initial take, as we all say, you know, everyone's like, ah, I could do better, and then you go back to that first one. and You're like, nope, yep. that's the one. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know why that is. 
Yeah, I'm not sure whether it's just the energy that you're putting in in the moment that somehow comes across in the air. Yeah. Like you're listening yeah, yeah. to it through the speakers or whatever, but you, can, you totally feel that. We were talking about Nuno before, and he, he seems to be a big advocate of that whole capture it, right? You know, for yeah. better or for worse, right at the head, get that energy. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. Like, I mean, he says he doesn't demo songs, which is right. fair enough. Like, everyone's got their own approach. But I think there's definitely a benefit to demoing sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, particularly if you're... I mean, it depends as well on your approach and the music and what you're trying to do or tr trying to say or whatever, but I've found demoing to be quite beneficial. Yeah. Um, we didn't necessarily demo that stuff. I mean, on one hand, we had very limited time. So I guess you could say we sort of play, we kind of wrote it and then listened to the record because we, we were recording the whole time. Right. So we'd, we'd write it and then listen and be like, that's cool, we'll change that section maybe. Yeah. So you are kind of real time demoing, but you haven't got barely any time to go back in and then record the I final think, version. But that's, a, that's an effective use of demoing where you go, here's the gist of what we want, here's what we want to keep, and it's like, yeah, the demo, I didn't like that part from the demo. So you almost, you know ahead of time to steer away from the bits you didn't really care for. Yeah. But to just get it down on a demo, there's no evil in that. Right. Uh, and it's always alarming to hear how different uh, a, a demo can be compared to the final product. Yeah. Um, for better, for worse. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's uh, it's just it's cool to see it in the embryonic stage. Yeah, definitely. And that's one of the things about the totemist, which is there because of the fact of the way it's done like that. Mm -hmm. So it does feel like it's like the fresh idea is then the song. You know? So then I have to ask: Is there a meaning behind the totemist? Is there some sort of mystery, or is it uh, something you uh, will not explain? I no, like because no, no. he looks off into the yeah, distance. You're like, I don't know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, so like, it's, I think I can't remember what I can't even remember how I landed on it but i know it's something to do with the idea of a totem pole being the thing that people like do is it like rituals or whatever like yeah, it's a native sure. american thing yeah they're totem poles uh, yeah. yeah um it's emblematic of something yes and i remember thinking it had something to do with like two guys like you know dancing around this totem pole of prog or something like i can't remember exactly but, but just it, kind of stuck yeah, yeah and and the name sounded cool like I just don't remember exactly where it came from. Well, Russell than... and I did that. We did an EP called Tickle Fight, which is kind of the same concept. <laughs> okay. It's not released yet. So. Well, it's yeah, by the it's, time this comes out. It's just okay. for us. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about it after. This is okay. awkward pause. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> I like to do that. It usually sets him off. He doesn't yeah. know what to do now. He's not going to recover. <laughs> so we're done. Thank you for your time. <laughs> tickle Fight's good, though. You, you can have that for the next one. Maybe okay. the LP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Tickle good. Fight. You know, Totemist. So colon. you mixed in your master. <laughs> no, you, Sorry. Did, you did that, right? I did, yeah. Um, again, that for me was the turning point where I was like, "Oh, I'm seems like you're pretty the excited about the, your, 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 the results from your mixing." I think, yeah, I just the, from the first EP and then to now, like I just felt like there was there was a moment where I turned a corner and was like, "I actually don't mind listening to this like sonically," uh, and felt like maybe I was starting to get the hang of it a bit more. Yeah, like knowing what I wanted stuff to sound like or react in the mix stage and being able to achieve that. You know, like, oh, I want a, I want a, sn you know, like, I remember thinking on one of the songs on the first EP, Roast Host, it's called, um, I want the snare to sound a little bit kind of like Brendan O'Brien Mastodon kind of, you can hear that sort of papery element to it. Love that. You know, yeah. like, I remember thinking I want it to sound like that and trying to achieve it. And it, obviously it's a different sound, but it has that quality to it. And mm -hmm. I remember thinking that wasn't hard to get to that point and stuff, you know? Right. That's a really good point, though. You think about it, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, how many great albums we've probably heard since, let's say, the 70s, and how a snare drum can affect the entire sound, oh. of, whether you like it or not. And we have a million examples of what... But it's funny how something that small, if, if that seed of an idea, can go, okay, that, that made the song. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and, big time. And, and that, was there a secret piece of gear that you used that you're like, man, if I couldn't do it without this? Maybe um, that's not a guitar or an amp. Anything that really kind of brought that forth? Well, I mean, from the production of the the record, I guess, like, I would say it has to be the UA interfaces because they have all those amazing plugins in. It's amazing. It, it was all done in the box, you know, like, obviously, we recorded into nice pre's at the sure. studio. But outside of that, I literally, I think I would say it was a combination of the smash and grab compressor and GGD. That thing's insane. Mm -hmm. uh, and then just the UAD stuff because... They did their homework. Yeah. and I, So good. I don't have thousands of pounds to buy all this outboard, outboard gear, gear. That, that the mix is running through virtually, you know, right. like Shadow Hills compressor and, yep. you know, like SSL stuff. You're just like, this would have been Neve tens consoles, of yeah. thousands of pounds. Sure. 
So I, th I just think that that's been amazing as well to also discover, like I have a great relationship with Universal Audio and um, been fortunate enough to have a bunch of the plugins to like learn and use and work out what works and what doesn't and the things that I like and the things I don't like. And, yep. um, so I would say that's probably the piece, of, the invaluable piece of gear. Cool. Have you messed with Luna? Uh, I tried. Okay. But I started recording. The only thing I ever saw was Logic. Yep. Like when I was on about Dave earlier, the bass player, like he used Logic. That's all I'd ever seen. I'd never seen any of the DAW. Right. So I can't, I've tried. Okay. You know, I've tried. Yeah, yeah, logic yeah. works. Yeah. I've tried to use Ableton, struggle. I've tried to use Pro Tools in the studio, really struggled. Hmm. Um, and Luna's kind of a bit of both of those. Yep. And I tried. Okay. Yeah. But I just can't. It's okay. There's, logic. This is a safe place. Yeah. Yep. We're glad <laughs> That's good. Yeah. It's important. We yeah. did tickle fight was in Luna, so it was just. Oh, was it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you'll hear it in the final <laughs> result. It's, nice. Uh, it's really um, good. Last question. Okay. All right. And this is a deep one. We all want to know. At what age did you get the fro? Full on be a fro. <laughs> um, so I started growing it when we decided that we wanted to do like the band thing. So, yeah. Uh, would I have been nineteen? Yeah. Was nineteen 19 years 19. old. I started growing it out. And it stopped growing now. Okay. <laughs> do you feed it? What do you do? Nothing. That's a different, that's Nothing. A different YouTube channel. It's one of those things. It's just like, I think I didn't realize how low maintenance it was until it was there. Yeah. I was like, ah, this is easy. Like you realize you can't go back. I mean, like the, you are captive now. Yeah, I feel I haven't wanted to like change. Although hair. it's like when Bob Dylan goes electric. So who knows? Well, yeah. I mean, the only thing I have said there is if I start startled. losing my hair or whatever, like it's going. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be one of those... Yeah. It just like holds on to it. Like if it starts, if I start balding at the I, crown, I can relate, oh God, I can relate to you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, just, I, I think like you say, I've just imprisoned myself in having an Afro. <laughs> there are worse problems to have. Yeah. It's easy for my friends to put me out in the crowd though. Like when we do music festivals, like. They, yeah, there he is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It works. Lee, Ander Lee Anderton can't do that. I no, tried to find him once at NAMM so. and I couldn't. Yeah. No, <laughs> no. A bunch of pasty white guys. <laughs> Well, Gary, we do appreciate you coming out, man, spending the time with us in the hang. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the great questions and hanging out. and It's been awesome. awesome. Thank you. Great answers, Thanks. too. Thanks. And a huge thank you to Victory. Head on over to AmericanMusical.com to check out the Victory VX Kraken Mark II. And make sure to subscribe to American Musical Supply for more content like this.